Let me show you now a way you can use a mathematical tool called Pascal's Triangle to simplify the solution of a genetic problem, one involving multiple genes. Let me give you a case, a, a, a special case of multiple genes, one in which there, um, let's, say, let's take uh, plant height as, as an example. Here is a plant that uh, can exist in a number of heights, let's say all the way from, well, we'll get that in a minute here, from tall to short and many different heights in between. And let's say that height is controlled in this plant by four genes, four genes. So we have the big A gene, the big B gene, the big C gene, and the big D gene. And these four genes work in a fashion that we're going to call equally additive. Equally additive. That is, you can think of each one of these capital letter leals as adding a certain amount to the height of the plan. There's a base height, and then each one of these capital letter leals adds the, a certain amount to the height of the plan. It doesn't matter if it's a big A or a big B or a big C or a big D, each one adds the same amount. So they're working additively in determining the height, uh, but in an equal fashion. So you can see this is a great example of multiple genes, more than one gene, determining this one continuous trait, um, this one uh, um, quantitative trait. So uh, let's, uh, let's add, give a little bit more to this theory here. Let's say that in our plant, there is a base height of 20 centimeters. And every one of these capital letters, I'll just call it every capital allele, adds five centimeters to that base height. So we've got starting off with a base height of 20 centimeters, and each capital letter adds uh, 5 centimeters to that. That means that our shortest plant is going to be only 20 centimeters tall, and it will have this genotype. Little a, little a, little b, little b, little c, little c, little d, little d. It will have no capital letters, so it's just the base height. That means that our tallest plant then will be adding five centimeters for every one of these. It will be the one that is big A, big A, big B, big D, big C, big C, big D, big D. And we have eight of those, right? Eight capital letters. Eight times five would be 40. So this plant is going to be 40 plus 20. It's going to be 60 centimeters tall. So our shortest plant would be 20 centimeters tall, and our tallest plant would be 60 centimeters tall. What would happen if we crossed two of these? Well, this would be a simple tetrahybrid cross, and this parent would contribute a big A, big B, big C, big D allele. That parent would contribute a little A, little B, little C, little D allele, and we would get big A, little A, big B, little B, big C, little C, big D, little D. There, here is our P generation. Here now is our F1 generation. And we know that this individual will now have a base height of 20 plus 5 centimeters for each capital letter. 5, 10, 15, 20. It's good. So this plant is going to be 40 centimeters tall. As you might expect, that's right in between 60 and 20. 40 centimeters tall. Now what if we cross two of those? We now have a tetrahybrid cross. If you wanted to solve this the long way, the complicated way, you could make a Punnett square here, filling in all the gametes that this parent makes down the left side, all the gametes this parent makes across the top, and then fill in all of those squares. Now how many gametes are we going to have? Remember that rule, the number of gametes that the F1 individual makes, the number of different gametes, is 2 to the n, where n is the number of genes. So we're going to have 2 to the 4th power here. That's going to be 16 gametes. 
So we'd have to fill in 16 gametes down here, 16 gametes across here, fill in all of every one of those squares, and then go back and figure out, okay, which one of these, what height are each one of these, and it would take the two test periods to complete that problem uh, if you did it the hard way. So let's not do it the hard way, let's do it the simple way. You can do this the simple way using a tool called Pascal's Triangle, and I'll show you how that works. First of all, let me tell you or why that works. Let me sh first of all show you what Pascal's Triangle is. You probably remember this. For Pascal's Triangle, you put a one here, and then you always write a one on the outside. Then you add the two inner numbers together to give them the next number here. So we're gonna put a one here. We add one and one together, we get two. And we put a one out here. Put a one here, we add one and two together, and get three. Two and one together, and we get three. And there's a one. One, four, six, four, one. One, five, ten, ten, five, one. One, six, fifteen, twenty, fifteen, six, one. And I think we're going to stop right there. We could keep on going. Now, take a look at this Pascal's Triangle. There should be something that's vaguely familiar about it. Look at that right there. What does that represent? One to two to one. Does that sound familiar? One to two to one is the genotypic ratio you see with a one gene cross, with a monohybrid cross. You have uh, big A, big A, excuse me, big A, little a, in the F2 generation, big A, little a, cross with big A, little a, you get big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a in a one to two to one ratio. If we were dealing with a gene like one of these that adds height for every capital allele, this would also be the phenotypic ratio. These would be the tallest, the middle size, and the shortest. So this tells us what the height of those plants would be for one gene cross. So this is this would be a the uh, different heights that we would expect of the diff uh, uh, the, the different numbers we'd expect of the different heights for a one gene cross. Well, if you skip two rows and go down here, now we haven't actually done this, but if you go down here, this is the ratio that you would get for a two gene cross. Uh, we didn't actually do this, but if you do a two gene cross, you end up with uh, a genotypic ratio, and this is a little bit of extra information here, maybe more than you need. You end up with a genotypic ratio. If you looked at that entire Punnett square, you end up with a genotypic ratio that looks like this, where if you go in and fill in all of these genotypes, oops, made a mistake there. really have to understand all this in order to get what, what I'm, I'm trying to show you, but I want to prove to you that it's really true. Here are the genotypes that are present in, a, in that 4x4 Punnett, that, uh, four four Punnett square for a dihybrid cross. If you go through and group those into phenotypes, you will find that here is one phenotype. If phenotypes, if this is the situation where the number of capital alle alleles is all that matters, here we have four capital alleles, here we have three there we have two, there we have three, here we have two, here we have one, there we have two, here we have one, and here we have zero capital alleles. So we would have a, a phenotypic ratio. Well, there's, there's uh, four capital alleles. There's only one of those for the four capital alleles. Three capital alleles. Well, there's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, four capital alleles. We want th uh, three capital alleles, and we have this one and this one, which is going to give me four. So you, okay, there's four capital alleles. Here's three capital alleles, that one and that one, and that's this and this. So there's four that have uh, three capital alleles, two capital alleles. That would be that one and that one. And that one, and that's one, and four makes five, and one more makes six. There's six of those. 
So one capital allele, that's this one and this one, that's four, and no capital allele, zero. So this actually turn, turns out to be the ratio that we would expect if there were two genes operating in this equally additive fashion. Well, we have four genes. I am going to have to go a little bit further here. This is only three genes. The next row would represent three genes. And so we have to extend our Pascal's triangle a little bit more. 1, 7, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, 1, 1, 8, 28, 56, 70, 56, 28, 8, 1. This row, we skip down now another two rows, this row will represent the phenotypic ratio we would expect to see with four genes that operate in an equally additive fashion. This is four genes. What does that mean? That means, remember, the way these genes operate, all that's important is the number of height-contributing alleles, the number of capital letters. So this one is going to have eight of those capital letters. In other words, this one will be big A, big A, big B, big B, big C, big C, big D, big D. So that's, that's going to be the, 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 the ones that have eight capital letter alleles. These will have seven capital letter alleles. Big A, little a, big B, big B, big C, big C, big D, big D. Or maybe it's the B that has the small lowercase, or the C that has the lowercase, or the D that has the lowercase. But they'll have seven of the capital alleles. These will have six capital alleles. This will have five. That will have four capital alleles. In other words, half of them are capital letters and half of them are small letters. Three, two, one, and zero. Here are the ratios, here is the ratio in which those individuals from tallest to shortest should appear in the F2 in this F2 generation. If you add all those numbers up, they're going to come to 256. Therefore, in this cross, we're going to get those heights, the ones that have eight capital letters, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and zero. This is the number of, I'll just say, big alleles. What height do, they, do those represent? Well, the height of these is 20 plus the four, uh, five centimeters for every uh, capital allele. That's 20 plus 40. These will be 60 centimeters. These have only, uh, instead of eight, they'll have seven of those uh, uh, height contributing allele, so it'll be five centimeters shorter, 55 centimeters, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. Here are the, here are the actual heights. What proportion will they exist in? This right here tells us the answer to that. One out of 256 will be the tallest. Eight out of 256 will be the next height. 28 out of 256 will be 50 centimeters. 56 out of 256 will be 45 centimeters. 70 out of 256 will be the intermediate height, 40 centimeters. Uh, 56 out of 256. Um, 28 out of 256. 8 out of 256 and 1 out of 256. We now have the proportion in which each one of these heights will be represented in this F2 generation. A lot easier than doing a ridiculous 16 by 16 Punnett square and trying to uh, find the answers from that. So uh, now you could, you could, on a test you could do, I could give you a problem like this and ask you to tell me the phenotype of every one of those individuals. I probably won't do that. Instead, I would ask you to give me the phenotype of just one of them. Maybe I would say, from this cross, 
what proportion will be, oh, let's say 35 centimeters in height? Well, you would say, okay, that means it's 20 plus 15 in order to be 35. And so it must have three of the capital letter alleles because that three times five is 15. So anything that has three of the capital letter alleles is what I'm looking for. And that would be that one right there. So your answer would be 56 out of 256. And on the test, you can just leave it like that if you want to. You can reduce that fraction or turn it into a decimal. That'd be fine. So first of all, I probably will not ask you to calculate the height of every single plant. I mean, the proportion of every single plant in this. I'll probably pull one out and say, what's the height of this one? Because if you can do that, you can do the rest of them. And also, like I said, I probably will not ask you a four gene problem. I'll probably ask you a three gene problem or a two gene problem, simply because when you get down here to the fourth and the fifth, it's, it's really easy to start making mistakes on your Pascal triangle. And I'd hate for you to miss the problem just for a simple math mistake like that. And if you can do the, these, you could actually, if you can do the simpler ones, you can do the more uh, complex ones too. So that's how to use a Pascal triangle in determining the proportion of the individuals that will show up in the F2 generation involving multiple genes that act in an equally additive fashion.